The reading is John chapter 21, verses 1 to 25. It's on pages 1090 of the Church Bibles. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred meters. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, John, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumour spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you that the scriptures point to the Lord Jesus. And we pray that as we reflect on him and his words and instruction to us this evening, you would build us up and strengthen us and help us in our faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What does it look like to follow Jesus given he's not around anymore? When Jesus ministered on earth, 
Um, following him wasn't easy, that's for sure. But it was fairly straightforward or simple to understand in the sense that it meant to walk with him and to listen to him and to learn from him and to copy him and to trust him. He was there. But what about now? What does it mean to follow Jesus today? How do you learn from someone who's not around anymore? How do you walk with someone you can't see? Well, I think those are some of the questions that Jesus addresses as he prepares his disciples for his departure. At last week, we looked at the first half of this chapter, Jesus' third resurrection appearance uh, to his disciples on the beach as he fed his disciples with that miraculous catch of fish. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on the second half of this chapter and the key conversation that happens between Jesus and Peter after breakfast. Um, who knows what the chat was like over that barbecued breakfast? What did they talk about? Did they talk about anything? Uh, did they just eat in silence? Did the disciples just bowled over by their experience? We're not told. But after they finish eating, it seems that Jesus and Peter go for a walk, a stroll uh, down the beach. It turns out to be probably the most significant walk and talk in Peter's life. And there are two main instructions that Jesus gives Peter in the course of that conversation. And we're going to look at each in turn. Feed my sheep. And follow me and consider how they apply to us. Feed my sheep and follow me. Firstly, feed my sheep, looking at verses 15 to 17, as Jesus commissions Peter to feed and take care of his sheep. But before all of that, Jesus has a question for Peter. As they walk, Jesus turns to Peter, and there's a real weightiness and seriousness to his tone of voice. He addresses Peter formally, uh, Simon, son of John. Uh, straight away, you get the sense that this is not going to be a light question. What do you, what do you fancy dessert for dessert? Do you want to take a tea or a coffee? No, this is going to be a serious question, demanding a serious and weighty answer. Simon, son of John, he says, do you love me more than these? That is, I think, do you love me more than the others love me? Now, that might seem a strange, que strange question to our ears, but Jesus is only really picking up on what Peter has kind of implied all along through Jesus' earthly ministry. You think back to John 13, and Jesus says to the disciples, Where I am going, you cannot follow now. And Peter replies, not by saying, we will lay down our lives for you, but by saying, I will lay down my life for you. Implication, what you say, Jesus, might well be true of the others, but it's not true of me. Because, implication, I love you the most. I wouldn't do that. I love you the most. And here Jesus asks Peter, do you? Is that true? Peter answers sincerely, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replies, Feed my lambs. Jesus again asks Peter, Do you love me? Maybe Jesus didn't hear him the first time, or maybe Peter didn't sound very convincing. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. And then Jesus asks a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it becomes very, very clear that Jesus is naming the elephant. He's putting on the table Peter's three-time denial of him. It's almost as if Jesus is saying here, look, Peter, you had three chances to be loyal to me when I needed you most, and yet you disowned me. So I really need to know that you love me, that is, that you that you really love me. Not like last time when you promised me the world and then disowned me. Do you love me? And of course, Peter is hurt because he knows what Jesus is getting at. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, 
feed my sheep. You see, in commissioning Peter, Jesus needs to hear from him that he really loves him. You know, if this were a job advert for the role of feeding Jesus' sheep, loyal love for Jesus would be right there as the key qualification. To be useful for Jesus, we must first love him. Jesus says, do you love me? And so with Peter's love for Jesus established, Jesus commissions him three times, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Uh, from John 10, we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. Um, his sheep are his people, those for whom he would lay down his life, those who know him, who listen to his voice. And as Jesus prepares to return to his Father in heaven, he calls Peter to continue that shepherding work, to be his chief under-shepherd, if you like, and to feed his sheep. Every so often we visit family who live next to a farm, and any time we're there, the farmer is always very happy for us to, to come uh, next door and into the barn to see his animals, and it's lovely for the kids to be able to do that. Last time we were there, it was last spring, and so the barns were full of lambs. And it was just really, really interesting to see the farmer and his attention to detail, making sure these lambs were well fed, making sure they got the right hay and grain and supplement. And if the, if the mother wasn't feeding them right, he'd make sure they had bottled milk and feeding them, taking care of them. Here, Peter is commissioned by the good shepherd to take care of and feed his sheep. Uh, what was the food that Peter and the other apostles were to feed his sheep? Well, the bread of life. Uh, Christ himself was the food. Uh, John 6, 57, Jesus says, The one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the food with which they're to feed his sheep. Uh, Peter and the apostles are to feed Jesus' sheep with their testimony with their teaching, with the truth about Jesus. Just as Jesus had appeared to them and nourished their faith with this miraculous catch of fish, so Peter and the apostles were to testify about him and to nourish his sheep's faith. Feed my sheep. Well, how does this apply to us? Well, of course, a, a few of us here are under shepherds, not apostles, but elders. And so there's going to be application uh, for us on the importance of loving Jesus loyally, of, give, of giving Jesus' people a spiritual diet that is rich in Christ, feeding people Christ. There'll be application there. But for all of us, if we're trusting in Christ, we are Jesus' sheep. And so I think the main application for us as his sheep is to come to the apostles and to feed on their testimony and their teaching about Christ. If you like, to dine at their table, to book, to book in at their restaurant, to go to them, the apostles, Jesus, Peter, for our spiritual food. They're his chief under shepherds. They're the ones commissioned by him to feed us. We should go to them. Sometimes we worry. Sometimes we think, well, unless I can find a quote from Jesus, from Jesus' own lips on some particular issue, then we can feel like we're on shaky ground. Well, the apostles said it and not Jesus himself. So can we be sure? Well, this is telling us that no, 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 we can trust them. Indeed, we must trust them and feed off them. Because here Jesus endorses them and commissions, commissions them to feed us. Last summer, we went out for lunch um, to, to a place we would norm not normally go to. It wasn't the kind of place that would normally appeal to us. It was kind of st street food um, kind of place. Um, why did we end up going there? Why did we trust them to feed us? Why were we so keen to get a table there? Well, because the chef had Gordon Ramsay's endorsement and seal of approval. Uh, the, sh the chef at this place had trained under him. And you could really tell because it was amazing. Well, here is Jesus' seal of approval on Peter and his apostles, giving us confidence that the spiritual food that they're going to serve is going to be good and true 
and nourishing and safe for us. So firstly, what does it look like to follow Jesus, given he's not around anymore to teach us in person? Well, it's going to look like feeding from the hand of his apostles, commissioned by him, told to feed us so we should feed from them. But then secondly, looking at Jesus' second command to Peter, follow me. Looking here at verses 18 to 25, follow me. Because Jesus then tells Peter what's going to happen to him later in life, which is not normally how God operates. Uh, for the vast majority of us, the vast, vast majority of us, our future is secret. We won't know it, and that is a kindness. But for Peter here, Jesus discloses to him his fate, uh, namely that he's going to glorify God by being executed for Christ. Verse 18 and 19. Jesus says, very, very, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. John tells us Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. In other words, Peter's life as an old man is going to be very, very different to when he was young because as a young man, he was free. He dressed himself. He went where he wanted to go. I mean, we saw that even just last week, able to say uh, in a moment, let's go fishing. And out he goes fishing. Able to say, I'm going I'm to jump over the side of this boat and swim to Jesus. And that's what he does. He was free as a young man. But Jesus says when he's old, his freedoms are going to be stripped away. Someone else will dress him. Rather than deciding on his own itinerary based on where he wants to go, he's going to be led against his will where he does not want to go. John tells us that means he's going to be led to his execution. In other words, Jesus here gives Peter the details of what it's going to look like and mean for him to take up his cross. And Jesus' encouragement and instruction to him in, a, in this is all very, very simple. It's the end of verse 19. Follow me. Keep your eyes focused on me. Keep your thoughts centered on me. Think about me. Remember me. Copy me. Trust me. Follow me. Rely on me. Which is exactly what Peter needed to hear. Because what's Peter's response to all of that? Lord, what about him? As he turns and looks at John following behind. Jesus says, follow me, copy me, rely on me. Peter says, what about him? Now, I don't think uh, Peter was asking here out of a sense of unfairness. Probably just out of concern for his brother in Christ and friend. But what's Jesus' answer? Uh, great question, Peter. Let me tell you all about what's going to happen to him. Not quite. Verse 2, he, Jesus answers enigmatically. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me, he says for a second time. In other words, don't worry about him. Leave his future to me. I've got a plan for his life as well, but you don't need to know it. You need to follow me. Fix your eyes on me, not on what's going to happen to him. Now, for us readers we're told about John's future. Uh, not spared death, as some believers thought John might be. John quashes that rumor by pointing us to exactly what Jesus did and didn't say about his future. Not spared death, but given a long life in which to testify to Christ. We see it in verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. And so we see these two men, Peter and John. Peter's cross would be a literal one, martyrdom. John's cross would be a long life of faithful, sacrificial service, testifying to the Lord Jesus and the many, many wonderful things that he did. And Jesus' message, don't worry about the other one. Focus on me and follow me. And that is just a really helpful principle for us too, 
as we seek to follow the Lord Jesus. Uh, following Christ will be costly for all of us, Jesus assures us. We can't avoid the cost. Each of us will have a cross to carry. And yet the shape of that cross and the particulars of the cost that each of us will bear will be different. For some of us, following Christ and taking up our cross will mean trusting him in a life which is marked by suffering. For others, it will mean being faithful to Christ amid persecution, perhaps amid poverty for Christ. For others, it might look like a long life of hard work in his service. And Jesus' lesson for us here is quit looking sideways. Yes, we've got concern for our brothers and sisters. Yes, we want to walk with them in the particulars of their life and pray for them. We are one body. But we're to stop, if you like, looking over the fence at what God has in store for other disciples. What about him? What about her? Why do I have to suffer in this way? And yet he doesn't and she doesn't. Instead, to follow and to focus on Christ. Jesus says to Peter very clearly, what is that to you? You must follow me. One of the signs of an inexperienced sprinter is that they can't resist looking left and right uh, at the runners either side of them in lane, th in lane two and in lane four. It's classic sports day, school sports day type, type thing. That's really detrimental because as they run and look this way, they drift this way. And as they run and look this way, they drift that way. And it's not good for their own race. And the athletics coach, one of the first thing they will do is to try and get them to unlearn that habit. And instead to be like the senior athletes who, when they sprint, they just look straight ahead. Whatever is going on in four and two, it doesn't matter. It's inconsequential to their race. They just look straight ahead and run. And likewise, Jesus is teaching us just to unlearn that habit of comparing our cross with that of other believers. Why am I getting it in the neck at work, but not her? And, and instead to keep looking straight ahead, following and focused on Christ, whatever our circumstances, however different they may, to, they may be to our brothers and sisters. So how does it look? What does it look like to follow the Lord Jesus given he's not around anymore? Well, it's going to look like feeding confidently with certainty from the hand of the apostles, the ones who were commissioned to feed us, taking our truth from them and to follow him, whatever the cost. How are we going to manage that? Not by looking sideways all the time but by keeping our eyes fixed on him, the one who died for us, the one who rose again to forgive us and secure for us eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus, our Savior, our King, the one who did extraordinary things, so many things, not even that we, we have accounts of. And yet who died for us and rose again. Help us please as we seek to follow him day to day. Help us to feed confidently from the apostles hand as they tell us the truth about you. Help us to focus on you and to follow you. Eyes fixed only on you. We pray you'd help us in Jesus name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close, Christ is mine forevermore, as we consider that call to follow the Lord Jesus.
to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.